With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast. Hour 2. Hello, America. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number, 877-973-7425. Really, really delighted to have you with me. Uh, As I mentioned the last hour, if you text data, the word data, or you can text Eric, E-R-I-C-K, either one, to 33777, and you you click the link into my show notes, you can see the agenda for the gathering. Uh, It happens August 17th to the 19th. It's going to be here in Atlanta. Uh, the Grand Hyde in Buckhead. We've got a uh, number of the major presidential candidates coming. Governor Glenn Youngkin of Virginia not running for president is going to come. Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia not running for president is going to come. But Mike Pence, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, Chris Christie, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, Ron DeSantis, they're all going to be there as well. Tom Cotton of Arkansas, Joni Ernst of Iowa. A number of others are coming. We're kind of in the last 17-day scramble. we got to find a printer to print the signs and the lanyards and the bags and we got to put the final closing touches on the welcome reception and all that. It's going to be a busy, busy time. Now, these next 17 days, getting the printing done and, and the final setup done. Uh, but it's going to be great. We've got some great sponsors, and I'm excited. Many of you I know have tickets from around the country. We've got 47 states coming. Uh, we do not have Alaska, Hawaii, or Vermont, um, but we got got people from the other states coming. It's going to be good. Uh, looking forward to it. Now, I, I want to switch gears. And by the way, for those of you who can't come, um, we're going to run clips on the show. If you have subscribed to my uh, Substack, you'll get clips of the the video interviews. You know, the, the format for this is nobody's allowed to give a speech. I used to let people give speeches then spend 10 minutes taking questions from the crowd. And now what I do is I just, in advance, get questions from the crowd and I ask them questions on stage, and it's a 30-minute conversation. And really what I want from the presidential candidates is, is why should people vote for you instead of these other people? What makes you more qualified? And I want to give them the opportunity to tell their story, but I don't want them to filibuster. So it's a conversation, and I can interrupt them, and, and we can have a good conversation instead of just letting them filibuster with a speech. It should be a good time. All right, I want to talk about farmers. The farmers have sh- are striking back. There is an element in the global warming movement uh, and the climate activist movement that is deeply, deeply hostile to capitalism. And they don't like capitalism. They, they think capitalism is bad. And then I look at a company like Apple that now gets 100% of its power from renewable sources around the world, wherever they're engaged, And they couldn't do that if they were some socialist, Soviet-controlled company. They've innovated. Capitalism allows innovation, and capitalism uh, is how we find a way out of of the climate situation. Whether it's natural or man-made, our adaptations come through the genius of capitalism, through innovation in capitalism. They're deeply hostile to it, however, and they're just more and more uh, obvious statements from climate activists who hate capitalism and believe capitalism is the problem. And you got to keep in mind, a lot of environmentalists and a lot of the people who come from the environmental movement were funded by the Soviets back in the 1980s. I would not be surprised to find out today that China is funding a lot of these climate activists in the West. Capitalism is good. Capitalism unshackled from ethics, however, is no better than socialism. Private equity increasingly gets a bad name, and frankly, it's deserved in many cases. There's a story out today in the Financial Times that a review of something like 20 years of research 
into hospitals and medical care companies that have been purchased by private equity shows care declines. Private equity is unshackled from morality and capitalism for the most part. And what I mean by the morality and capitalism is your job is to make a good or service that people want and they buy it from you. And you have every incentive to continue to improve the good or the service so that people continue to buy it and you make a profit while providing people something they want. In a lot of private equity cases and a lot of uh, amoral capitalism, the product and service are irrelevant. It's the money. And the job is to make money, not a product, a good or a service. And that's bad. And we see as companies get really big, they begin to become monopolies and oligopolies. And they use government regulation to shut out the Davids of the world so David can't take on Goliath. Ron DeSantis, will get into this, making his economic pitch is, is sounding like that, that we've got to not necessarily treat big as the be-all, end-all of things because sometimes when people and companies get too big, they then get too covetous. They get too um, – they, they hoard their cash. They're not good. Uh, they, they add inefficiencies to the market. Monopolies are notoriously inefficient. And in this country, in the beef industry – in particular, we have not a monopoly, but an oligopoly. The cattle business only has four major processing companies, Tyson, JBS, Cargill, and National Beef. They control 85% of the beef market. So farmers are now paid less and less for their cattle by these processors. The processors charge grocery stores more and more and they hold on to the profits. And when you become a, an oligopoly or a monopoly, that tends to be the pattern. It's why in capitalism they're considered bad and need regulation because their weight unlevels the playing field. In Illinois, or I'm sorry, Nebraska, this is beginning to change. There's a company called Sustainable Beef. Now, I realize for some of you, this topic will sound a little boring, but you need to follow along with me here. Sustainable Beef is a meat packing plant in Nebraska. And the ranchers from the Midwest and the Great Plains, from Missouri, the Dakotas, Montana, Iowa, Nebraska, they've all come together. And they're starting these meat processing facilities for themselves as cooperatives. Now, back when I left my practice of law where I went before I, I before I, I really went full-time at Red State I went up to Washington DC for a year and I took a job at the National Electric Cooperative Association National Rural Electric Cooperative Association the NRECA it was the trade group of the uh, electric cooperatives or cooperatives around the country Elec electric cooperatives came about during the New Deal era where individuals, in parts of the country could get together and collaboratively build power companies to electrify America. They did uh, electric cooperatives and they did phone cooperatives where people would come together and they would essentially build these companies that were member owned. So for example, if you were, if you got power from your local EMC, electric membership corporation, you were a member, you had voting rights and, and, and all that. It was like you belong to the company, the company belonged to you. And that's essentially what these cattlemen are now doing to fight the big four processing plants in the, com in the country. They've decided to come together and build sustainable beef, a meat packing plant that is operated as a cooperative between all the ranchers. So all the ranchers have ownership of it and they get to process their cattle. And now Walmart has come in recognizing that it can get lower prices from the cooperative than from the big four. And Walmart has decided to take all the beef. So Walmart can get it at a lower price and then undercut supermarkets in the area because Walmart's going to have beef that is as good of quality as they get from Tyson's, Cargill's, and the like, but they sell it cheaper because there's not as much of a markup. This is actually a really good thing. This is a very good thing. David Briggs is the CEO of Sustainable Beef. He says he expects the facility to be up and running by 2025. When the plant's fully operational, it'll process 1,500 cattle a day, 
1.5% of the nation's capacity. So they're not intending to really compete against Tyson, JBS, Cargill, and National Beef. They intend to offset them, though, offering cheaper prices, offering better prices to the farmers. And that's part of the key here. Y'all, it is not easy to be a farmer in America. It's never been easy, but it's harder now. Because of efficiencies and economies of scale, a lot of farm operations are now subsidies of giant corporations. And there's nothing wrong with corporate farming. The left would have you believe there's something wrong with corporate farming. And there's not. The problem, however, is that we have reached a point where inefficiencies are coming back in. The giant corporate farms worked out a lot of efficiencies of small farms, but are now adding as they become oligopolies and monopolies, new inefficiencies on the the operational side of the equation. And that harms harvesting, it harms prices. And so this is a genius way around it. A cooperative of farmers coming together. This is a great thing that's happening. And it is capitalism at its finest, where these farmers, they're not in this to make a massive profit. They're in this to make more money than they get from the Cargills and the Tysons of the world. But in the process, they may make more money, but you still get cheaper beef at the grocery store because they're not charging the the massive markups. This is a good deal. We need more of this, and we should be encouraging stuff like this in the country. Y'all know I I, I love to grill barbecue and smoke meat. I've got a Rectech, which is Pellet Grill. For years, I had a big green egg. Now, listen, I know if you're listening on my flagship station in Atlanta— WSB, um, the, the the Big Green Egg and the Kamado Joe people are there. And I love you. I love your ceramic grills. I do. I had a Big Green Egg for a decade, but I really like the convenience of my Rectech. Rectech is made in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, it's like a Traeger, but it's better build quality. It lasts longer. It gets hotter. Uh, I like the, the pellets they use better. Um, it's got a great operation. I can turn the sucker on with my phone over Wi-Fi. I can actually, I'm remote. I'm in my office. I could turn my pellet grill on at my home right now, get it up to temperature. And when I get home, it's at the temperature I need. I don't have to nurse it. I don't have to tend to the coals or anything like that. I don't need need a, 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 a drip pan. I don't need to put water in it. It just works. And I get great quality with it. I love it. And I love to smoke meats. And I like to find, listen, I love Omaha Steaks. I am a customer of Omaha Steaks. I genuinely, truly am a customer of Omaha Steaks. But I also like to find farmers around the country and farms that are selling things I can't get at Omaha Steaks necessarily, like whole uh, packer briskets, things like that. And I can get them from different farms around the country. There's a great place in Nashville called Porter Road that I order from. They they work with small farms in the area. Uh, there's a Tex guy, I guess, uh, T-E-X-G-A. Uh, my buddy Gary Black, who is the ag commissioner in Georgia, it's his daughter's place up in North Georgia. Um, they, they offer incredible quality meats direct from the farmers. I love them. Uh, White Oak Farms in South Georgia, sustainable farming operation. I really like to support local farmers, and I like to try to buy from the local farms and not from the big guys. I would much prefer to mail order a really quality brisket uh, butchered by a farmer who himself raised the cow because I think, one, you're helping prop up small farms at a time. It's really hard for the farmers, but, two, you're going to get better quality, less mass-produced meat time and time again. It's just noticeable quality. And it's great to see this innovation out there in America. And the problem is the environmentalists. Because the environmentalists, as much as they don't like corporate farming, they really don't like the expansion of butchering processing facilities in the country because they want us to eat less meat. And so the thing these farmers have to be weary of the regulators from Washington coming in and making life miserable for them. And there's a growing body of evidence that the regulators from OSHA and the EPA and the like are coming after farmers because they see farming as bad. In fact, when I come back, I'll play the audio of John Kerry attacking farmers. Why? Because of their carbon footprint. This is what we're going to have to deal with as they drive up prices. The farmers trying to bring up their own revenue while lowering prices for consumers. And the regulators in Washington, the Enviro Wackos, 
just try to raise prices on everybody to discourage you from eating beef. I am a small businessman. The company that I run for my radio show, it's a small business. I've got employees. I don't have HR. You may be in that situation and you may really need HR. Well, you may want to talk to Bambi. When running a business, your employees can create all sorts of interesting situations and they could get you in trouble. What happens when two employees are squabbling? One of them smells bad all the time. What do you do? How do you navigate the rules? With Bambi, you get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 a month. They're available by phone, email, real-time chat. Onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance. Your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. Let Bambi handle your employees for you. Their HR autopilot automates important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. Listen, you want U.S.-based HR managers who give you experience, expertise, a personal touch you need to make it seem like they're a part of your team. They can cost eighty grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 a month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now. Type in Eric Erickson under podcast when you sign up. It'll help you. It'll help your company grow. It'll help you keep peace of mind. It's spelled B-A-M-B-E-E. Bam. B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Eric Erickson. All right. As promised, this is John Kerry, the former Secretary of State and Senator, now climate czar who lied about his private airplane. Uh, Listen to John Kerry talk about farmers. Agriculture contributes about 33% of all the emissions of the world, uh, depending a little bit on how you count it, but it's anywhere from 26 to 33. And we can't get to net zero. We don't get this job done unless agriculture is front and center as part of the solution. But with a growing population on the planet, we just crossed the threshold of 8 billion fellow citizens around the world. We just crossed that in this last year. Emissions from the food system alone are projected to cause another half a degree of warming by mid-century on the current course that we are today. A two degree future could result in an additional 600 million people not getting enough to eat. And you just can't continue to both warm the planet while also expecting to feed it. Doesn't work. So we have to reduce emissions from the food system to keep the 1.5 degrees alive. Why do we have to keep 1.5 degrees alive? Because scientists, as a basis of physics and mathematics, not ideology and politics or party labels or anything else, as a matter of physics and mathematics and some biology and chemistry have told us these are the consequences and we already see it happening. And almost everything they've predicted for 30 plus years now is coming true, but the problem is it's coming true faster and bigger than was in fact predicted. You got that, farmers? You're gonna have to go to battery powered tractors now. They're coming for the farmers. By the way, uh, there's a whole lot of research out there that suggests that as it warms and there's more CO2, it's actually good for plants because plants love carbon dioxide. So you can actually expand crop yields. There's a whole lot of data out there on that. But John Kerry chooses to ignore that one in order to burden farmers with battery powered tractors. Now, some of you are burdened with getting your kids back to school. I don't know about y'all. My kids start on Monday. You may need to think about a laptop or desktop uh, computer for your kid for school, depending on where they're going, college even. Vision computers can take care of you. They get great deals. You're going to save some money with them, and you're going to get a computer that's going to last your kid through school. You're not going to have to keep upgrading every year. I mean, they're going to college. Get them a computer that can last them for four years, then you're not breaking the bank. And the cool thing is with Vision, they'll also service it, and there'll be tech support. So if your kid's away at college or you've got one for your high school or what not, and you need a laptop or desktop, they can call Vision like my son literally does this. My 14-year-old calls Vision, and there is tech support. They get his email set up. They've helped him with printer support. Uh, one of his monitors went out. He had accidentally unplugged it. They they were able to just navigate him through without making him feel like an idiot for having unplugged it. They're great. They can do this for your business, too. If you need computers for your business and you don't can't afford an IT department, Vision can serve that for you. 
comes with their computers. Call them 404 Compute anywhere nationwide. 404 Compute. Ask them about the Eric Erickson special. They can save you some money and give you great support. Did you know China has made it a priority to teach students financial literacy starting in preschool? Financial literacy isn't taught in our elementary schools, and parents lack the resources to teach it at home. American kids are yet again being left behind. Now there's a great way for parents and grandparents to help the kids they love learn about finance, thanks to The Sensibles. And at bcs-kids.com, The Sensibles are a team of animated superheroes who help kids age 6 to 12 develop smart money habits in a fun way. BCS-Kids.com was created to channel this multimedia resource to kids everywhere. Buy a subscription for your loved ones, and each month, they'll get a Sensibles kit in the mail with an entertaining DVD, comic book, and activities. Digital subscriptions are also available. They'll also get access to an interactive website with a library of lessons, fun activities, and more. Want 20% off the monthly subscription costs? Visit at bcs-kids.com, enter the promo code ERIC, my name, E-R-I-C-K. It's the sensible thing to do. Subscribe today at bcs-kids.com. Why, hello there. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the United States of America. The phone number, 877-973-7425. The, the pivot has begun. Ron DeSantis moving into talking about the economy, but also Hunter Biden. He made a good point uh, on TV yesterday about Hunter Biden. Well, this is why we say there's two standards of justice. If Hunter were a Republican, he'd be in jail by now. You look at all this smoke, and yet the FBI, where's the search warrants? Where's the, the, the grand jury? Where's the aggressiveness that they've shown going after some Republicans? You just don't Including see it. Including former President Trump. Including former President Trump. I mean, compare how they handled the Mar-a-Lago. They went through everything they could to get any piece of information. They are not doing that with Hunter. Of course, they didn't do it with Hillary back in 2016. It's true. It's true. Well, DeSantis is trying to pivot, um, but along the way, he, talking to Brett Baer last night, had to talk about Hunter Biden. Hunter, he's selling picked, uh, paintings for over a million dollars? You know, my six-year-old daughter does better paintings than him. Maybe we'll put ours up and see what kind of things she can fix. I don't tough, think we're going to get a million dollars on it. We will go in there and we will make all of this stuff better very, very quickly. Good for him. Now, uh, a little bit from his speech yesterday, his um, uh, economic declaration of independence. So here's what we have to do to get this right. First, we have to restore the economic sovereignty of this country and take back control of our economy from China. This abusive... The abusive relationship, the asymmetric relationship between our two countries must come to an end. No more massive trade deficits, no more importing of goods uh, with stolen intellectual property, no more preferential trade status. We need to incentivize the repatriation of American capital and investment here in the United States so we can recapture our supply chains and build a strong, durable industrial base. And in Florida, uh, we've actually taken action against the CCP. We have banned the purchase of land in Florida by members of the Chinese Communist Party or its affiliate. Notable, uh, the Super PAC tied to Nikki Haley today is also launching an ad, uh, and that ad focuses on Nikki Haley taking a very strong stance on China, um, clearly China becoming the campaign issue for Republicans when it comes to foreign policy, which, I mean, makes a lot of sense when you think about it, given just how much uh, the conversation right now relies or, or revolves around foreign policy-wise what China is doing or not doing, particularly what China is doing with its ties to Russia, potential in uh, Taiwan, and Chinese land acquisition in the United States, there continues to be a series of weird, weird stories about Chinese land acquisition around military installations, among other things in the country right now. It's kind of disturbing. This is the Nikki Haley Super PAC ad uh, running Nikki now. Haley fought America's enemies at the UN and won. China's dictators want to cover the world in communist tyranny. 
Nikki Haley, tough as nails, smart as a whip, unafraid to speak the truth. Communist China won't just lose. Like the Soviet Union before it, Communist China will end up on the ash heap of history. Nikki Haley, a strong leader for a strong America. SFA Funding is responsible for the content of this advertisement. That's the Nikki Haley ad. Now, let's talk about the DeSantis pivot. Running a presidential campaign is no easy thing, and I will be blunt and honest with you. I believed that the DeSantis team had mapped out everything before he got in. You know, so when I ran campaigns, I used to run campaigns for a living. I know how to do this. I never ran them at the presidential level, but I did state races, uh, congressional races, county races, local races, and, and they all begin the same way. You sit in a room with the candidate and the candidate's spouse and close friends, and you do an honest, brutal assessment of the candidate, the strengths, the weaknesses of the candidate. And then you compare those strengths and weaknesses to the competition. In this case, Joe Biden, not Donald Trump, Joe Biden. Why? Because you want to win the general election. You don't just want to win the primary. But you obviously have to, in this case, figure out the path through or around Donald Trump. So you have to take that into account. And then you come up with some messaging. And you come up with a theme. And you tie it all together. And you get the candidate on that message. Ron DeSantis' theme is the great American comeback. You tie that into everything he says. The DeSantis team, however, stayed anti-woke. My suspicion, and I I don't have insider knowledge here, my suspicion, however, is the DeSantis team was making a good faith play to try to persuade Trump voters that DeSantis is their guy. And instead, what happened is the Trump team has spent more money attacking Ron DeSantis than attacking anyone else, including Joe Biden. And 25% to 27% of the GOP says they will only vote for Donald Trump. 25% of the GOP says they will vote for anyone but Trump. And the other 47 to 50% says, I am willing to consider someone other than Trump, but I like Trump. And this is a problem for DeSantis. He tried to make the play on anti-woke, I'm a fighter stuff to pull away Trump voters, and it hasn't worked for him. In the process, he stayed on it so long, he's alienated a lot of other voters. The, you see the decline in uh, DeSantis and the rise in people like Ramaswamy and Scott in direct relation to how long Ron DeSantis stuck with the anti-woke stuff and refused to pivot to anything else. He alienated people. I know people who were Ron DeSantis people who are like, he, he doesn't appear to be able to pivot. This seems to be culture warrior is the only thing he can do. And, and I, I get it, but I want more. And they, they've moved on to other candidates. So finally, the pivot has come with the economic message. His economic message is one of independence, and it's his economic declaration of independence. And essentially, it is uh, we got to move stuff out of China. China is our adversary, if not our enemy. They're not our economic trading partner, and we need to stop being so dependent on China for everything. And that is a good message. It is a good message that we need to be uh, on our own feet and we don't need to undermine our national security by being so overly reliant on China. Uh, He also supports ally shoring. He's not calling it that, but that's what I call it, where we work with our allies, where there are things we can't make cheaply in this country that need to be made cheaply. We can uh, help our allies construct them and and build meaningful trade relationships there. But by and large, a lot of it is is we jeopardize our national security and our economy by outsourcing so much. We deprive Americans of meaningful work and jobs, and we are burdening our future and making us dependent on China. It's a good message. He ties in the working class and the middle class and support for them. He, he ties in a fight about college debt uh, and, and the fight over uh, the student debt in this country and why colleges and universities with massive endowments need to be responsible. We've had a generation of students go deep into debt, 
And some of them end up with degrees in things like zombie studies, which are just not making a difference. And unfortunately, some of them end up in jobs they could have had right out of high school anyways. And so we just have to reorient this to yes, if you go in debt to get an engineering degree from MIT, you're going to be fine. You're going to be good. I'm not going to quibble with that. But a lot of these degrees have not given people a pathway to success, and it's caused them to be deep in debt. So what are you going to do about that? It's wrong to say that a truck driver should have to pay off the debt of somebody who got a degree in gender studies. This is not the taxpayers that should have to do that. At the same time, uh, I have sympathy for uh, some of these students because I think they were sold a bill of goods. I think these universities knew that they could take all this federal loan money, and if you're there for six years, hey, that's more money for them, right? And they do it, and they increase their administrative bloat, and they didn't make the, 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 uh, the instruction any better. And so what do you do? Well, I think the university should be responsible for the student debt. You produce somebody that can be successful, they pay off the loans. Great. If you don't, then you're going to be on the hook. That will cause a change in the type of course programs that a lot of these universities are offering. We've had a He's not wrong. That's a good way to look at it. He's, he's pushing these sorts of issues now. And I think that's it's necessary um, because we do need to do something with the student debt burden. Y'all, I'm I'm still paying on my student loans. Mine were not forgiven by Joe Biden, and I'm still paying on mine. I've got another 13, 12 or thirteen years to pay off student loans. It's like four hundred ninety dollars a month that I have been paying on since I got out of law school. I got a long way to go with my student loans. Had to, I refinanced them over time. I had to defer them for a time for economic hardship, things like that. I, I get it. I'm sympathetic to the people. I, I, I haven't practiced law since 2006, and I'm still paying on my law degree. But I made the choice. I undertook the debt. I don't think uh, people who didn't go to college should uh, have, to bail, have, have to bail me out. But I do think it was always a mistake, and I said so at the time, for Republicans to say you can't discharge student loan debt in bankruptcy. Let someone go through the bankruptcy process and ruin their credit for six or seven years, but get out of their debts. If colleges, colleges have grown disproportionately in cost and burden because they knew they could get away with it because of the student loan structure, DeSantis is right to take on the issue this way, that these colleges should be responsible for it. It's a good message. Now, a little more from his speech uh, in Iowa. But the bigger question is, what kind of a country do we want to have? And I want a country where Americans that work hard, Americans that get the most out of their God-given ability, are able to get ahead in this country, they're able to raise a, raise a family, and they're able to lead fulfilling and productive lives. And if we can't get that right, uh, then we are not going to succeed as a country. Again, he's right. You should be able to raise a family and feel like you're getting ahead in life in this country. And right now, a lot of people don't. But now here's the other issue. This is the DeSantis pivot. Does he stay pivoted? Or does he go back to the culture war stuff? Does Ron DeSantis make an economic case to Americans? He's got a vision for the future that transcends the culture war anti-woke stuff? Or does he just go back to the anti-woke stuff? Because the anti-woke stuff has gotten him every voter he's going to get. He's now got to go persuade the Ramaswamy voters and the Haley voters and the Scott voters and the Pence voters and the Christie voters and all the others that he's the guy who can be the replacement to Trump and he can advance their ideas. And some of them won't come because they're so diametrically opposed, but a lot of people went to those other candidates because they either got tired of waiting for DeSantis to get in or when he got in, they got tired of all he is as the anti-woke candidate and they wanted more. He's got to persuade him to come back. Can he make the pivot and can he keep the pivot going? This is for him to decide and his discipline. A lot of people all along have said it's Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is the issue. Uh, he's too online. He's too anti-woke. He's too culture warrior. He can't get it. He can't pivot. He can't shift. This is not his campaign. This is him. We're going to find out over the next several weeks as he's done this economic pivot. Is this now uh, a Ron DeSantis who can pivot and go to an economic message that resonates 
Or does he just go back to the anti-woke stuff that's already gotten him all the votes he's going to get for that message? I don't know. Time will tell. But the fact that his campaign saw the need to shake up, downsize, and pivot is actually a good sign. It gets him a couple of weeks of bad press while he does it, but he had to do something. He's still the only guy polling nationally against Trump in double digits. So he's got to do something, and this is it. We'll see if it sticks. Good for him, though. Now, I got to tell you about Patriot Mobile. Um, Patriot Mobile is a cell phone company, and the way they work is they're called a mobile virtual network operator, MVNO. means they use the cell, same cell towers that the big monopolies built. Congress lets them. So they operate like a standard cell phone company, but they use the towers you're already using, and then they get your phone number or give you a new phone number. You can roll your existing phone number over to them, but they have a specialized purpose, and Patriot Mobiles is they're Christian conservatives, and they grow their profits and then give those profits to the conservative movement. So if you wish to grow the conservative movement and use a cell phone company that shares your values, you go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric. They have a detailed coverage map. You can see how good the 5G, the data, the voice is, all of that. But also, if you call them at 972-PATRIOT, they have 100% U.S.-based customer service, and they give you great discounts if you're a veteran, a first responder, an NRA member. If you're a teacher, if you have a lot of lines because you've got a lot of kids who need cell phones, they can help you save money. Just call them, 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you. You get free activation with my name. Or go online, patriotmobile.com slash Eric. Patriotmobile.com slash Eric. Do business with a company that shares your values, and they give you great service in return. And then they grow the conservative movement as they grow their profits. I got to go to the phones. Uh, Craig's been waiting quite a while. Uh, Craig, I, I owe you an apology here. My call screening screen froze, I guess, because I didn't see any calls. And Charlie's like, you got people been waiting for a while. And I rebooted it, and suddenly there you've been waiting for over an hour. So I apologize. Oh, that's all right. It didn't cost me anything but a little time. And some dignity I probably weren't going to use anyway. So, <laughs> Well, but, what's uh, the question? Um, well, there's some polling I was hoping you can help me reconcile some polling trends here that just that they don't make sense. Uh, I mean, I won't get into the weeds of this poll and that poll, but over the last few few months, one side of the coin, the consensus has been that a large to a vast majority of Americans don't want either Trump or Biden as the nominees. But yet, when it comes to primary polling, it shows Trump and Biden running away with the nominations and the two just it doesn't seem uh, yeah. to work together. It's like if most Americans okay. don't want them, why are most Americans going to vote for them? So, so you got to so they poll like registered voters or likely voters, people who have voted. Likely voters are people who have voted in the past. Registered voters are just registered voters. What they do is then they pull out from that the people who are Republicans and the people who are Democrats. So when you add in the independents and the moderates, uh, a majority of Americans say we don't want either of these two guys. When you just look at the partisans, the Democratic partisans and the Republican partisans, they say they want Biden or they want Trump. When you add in the moderates and independents to those people, you see this polling shift of we don't like either of these people. If forced to choose, here's who we're going to go with, but we really prefer someone else. So you got to keep the, the, those segmentations in mind. Are they polling Republicans or Democrats or independents or everyone? And then on top of that, some polls just poll uh, everybody, all adult Americans. And those polls are kind of worthless because you're polling people who aren't even registered to vote. Um, but those are those are increasingly common. you gotta got to figure out who they're polling uh, to, to get uh, understand what's going on there. Hey, guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun, too. It's a thing, and now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun, Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino-style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere, and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.